Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. This is a continuation of our educational series on uh, fundamentals of uh, signal processing and audio measurements. Um, this is a simpler topic tonight uh, on dynamic range. Uh, it's an important topic because it, declare, it tells us how noisy a system is, and noise is quite audible. We could argue about whether distortion is audible, but you can hear noise. Uh, put your ear next to a speaker. If the amplifier is noisy, you'll hear noise. So we want to measure that always. want to know how clean our uh, uh, audio system is with respect to noise production. So one common test that I run, it has two names, signal noise ratio or dynamic range. I won't get into a distinction for now, but, but assume they're both the same thing for the purpose of this discussion. And uh, I have my audio precision analyzer running. The piece of hardware I always used for audio measurements. This is the user interface for it. Somebody asked, what is this software? This software goes with that hardware. They do sell this software by itself that you can connect to your own sound card but it's extremely expensive. I think it's $3,000 for the base software and then price goes up from there. So I don't know that you want to invest in, in this piece of software, but it's available. Anyway, I've told the audio precision analyzer to uh, connect this input to its output. I've set the signal level to four volts and set the frequency to one kilohertz. That's the convention we use one kilohertz tone. And uh, if I tell it to run, it takes a couple of seconds and it produces this uh, display that you see. And it's giving me 133 dB and change. What does this number mean? That means if whatever our noise floor is, our signal relative to that, that four volt signal is 133 decibels higher. Okay, so if you were to listen to this system at uh, this kind of loudness, 133 dB loudness, which is exceptionally loud, you go deaf, the noise floor would be at 0 dB SPL. Okay, so that's the range we're talking. So this obviously is phenomenal. Uh, we don't need 133 dB because we don't listen at 120 dB, uh, at 133 dB. Uh, but if we did, this system would be nearly silent. Our threshold of hearing is actually 10 dB below zero. So this is really equivalent to 123, it's still exceptional. And as it should be, this is an expensive piece of equipment designed for instrumentation. Now, the number that I picked in here is important. I put in four volts in here. Uh, notice what happens uh, when I put one volt in there and run the same test. We dropped a ton in here. So we went from 133 to 121. Why is that? The reason for that is that the noise of the instrument or the output of your preamp or DAC, what have you, is fixed. So when we tell it to generate a one killer's tone, that's riding on top of that. So if I set the one killer's tone at a higher voltage, let's say four volts, which I had, this distance is more than if I reduce that. So the more I reduce the voltage output of the, of the audio device, the smaller this, this ratio becomes. Remember, decibels is the ratio, ratio of this to this fixed noise. So. Uh, sorry, I didn't have my configuration right. So this is your fixed noise, and it does usually doesn't change. There are cases where this noise is actually signal dependent, but let's not get uh, wrapped up around that. Um, so the higher this voltage is, the better this number tends to be for audio equipment. So whenever you see a dynamic range specification, you must know this number. Otherwise, this is a meaningless value. Because if I measure two identical pieces of equipment, one of them is measured with one volt, the other one measured with four volts, and I get 12 dB difference, that doesn't make any sense. So we must have this, speci this specification. Now, for the most part, the standard in the industry is that if you have an RCA output of a, a you know, analog device, uh, audio device, these should have two volts of output maximum. So if you have a DAC that has RCA connectors at the end, you get two volts output. And if you have XLR balanced connection, it should have four volts output. Almost every desktop product that I test delivers on those. Uh, they can go higher, in which case you can dial them back down. Unfortunately, if you have an AV receiver or home theater processor, though that industry has decided on its own values for these things and usually much lower. And that hurts their performance often because they, instead of four volts, they may output 2.2 volts and they get distorted above that. So you need to have this number. So make sure you're always comparing the right things. I always standardize on this 
two volts for unbalanced if the device I'm testing only has unbalanced. If I'm testing XLR, then I'll set it to be four volts and measure that way. So let's go back to our four volts again and get that old measurement. So we're we'll back to 133 again. Down here, you see some additional parameters. I've told the analyzer to apply two filters. And by the way, this is the default uh, template that ships from Audio Precision. So uh, more, uh, this is more of an in, you know, industry convention is what they've implemented, which is we're interested in the noise from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. A, a piece of audio device can have constant noise throughout the frequency range, or it could have noise that goes up and down. So we need to decide how much of that noise energy we're going to capture. For obvious reasons, the convention is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, but it doesn't have to be. And indeed, if you play high res music, then you're dealing with higher sample rates. Therefore, you have wider bandwidth. So let's say, let's go ahead and change this um, from 20 kilohertz to 90 kilohertz. Now watch what happens to this number when I run it. I haven't changed anything else, but notice how we dropped down to 126. So we lost 6 dB of performance. Now this is an exceptional analyzer, very quiet in ultrasonics. Many audio devices have much more noise above 20 kilohertz. So if I include them in there, their performance could suffer tremendously. I mean, you could see 40, 50 dB drop. Now you have to be mindful of the fact that we don't hear that noise. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, should we measure that? You know, that's why by convention, you know, we measure 20 kilohertz over here, okay? Now, a, a convenient concept, so these numbers are there and you could try to memorize 120 dB, 180 dB, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean in practice? How do we translate this something that makes sense to us? Um, what I do, which the analyzer does not do by default, I do it manually. I convert all of these dynamic range or signal noise ratios to a number of bits, as if you had a digital system. How many bits would that be? I do that because all of us are familiar with CD being 16 bit format, and that's the streaming format, and that's 99.9% .9 of the content out there. So it's good to know how our system noise floor is relative to a 16 bit content. And uh, you know, we ideally, ideally, hopefully, we can reproduce 16-bit audio uh, from a CD without the system itself adding noise to it. A 16-bit system is, doesn't have sufficient dynamic range for the noise floor to be below our audibility, by the way. Uh, again, I'll cover that in a future video. But as a minimum, we don't want to add any noise to it that we already have in the channel, in the distributed media. So it's good to know what this translates to bits. We know 16 bits, how many bits is this? Can we get that number? We can, and uh, let me bring up my browser for you here and uh, turn off my uh, uh, video capture, there we go. So if you go on Wikipedia or just Google for this thing called effective number of bits, or E knob, as is said, you can see this wording down here. E N O B is the abbreviation for effective number of bits. If it takes, it shows a sign at, but basically, anytime you see a number in my dynamic range, take that, ignore this minus part, and divide it by six. And that gives you an approximate equivalent number of bits that you have. This is a uh, measure usually for analog to digital converters. And uh, it's a way to find out if we have, uh, you know, what is the equivalent bits is. Just because an analog digital converter says I'm a 24 bit converter doesn't mean that it produces 24 bits worth of accurate data. It has a lot of internal noise and it therefore generates X amount of useful data. So we steal this concept and then apply it to our measurements. And you see that in almost every review that I do. So if you look at this um, Flux uh, headphone amplifier FA12 review that I recently did, if you go down here, you see two measurements here. The one on the left is basically what I was showing you. I, uh, instead of using the analyzer measuring itself, in this case, I was measuring the uh, Flux. And it gives me 119 dB. If I divide this by six, 
it gives me 20 bits, roughly. 120 dB is 20 bits. 20 bits means we have four more bits worth of uh, dynamic range compared to a CD. I feel good about that. Uh, in general, I like to see a dynamic range that is 10 dB better than whatever format you play. So CD, at best case, is 96 dB. So you want to be at least 106 dB um, in the system. Here, we have more than 106 dB. We've got 119. But you quickly lose track of these numbers, right? That's why we just divide this by 6, and boom, we get 20 bits of dynamic range, and we're golden. So we know this will do justice to CD. Does it do justice to a 24-bit content that is truly 24-bit? Probably not, but recordings have you know, a fair amount of noise in them unless they're computer generated anyway. So 20 bits is fine. State of the art is 21, 22 bits. Um, can't get any better than that because just there's so much inherent noise in electronics. And by the way, this noise includes my analyzer noise. I cannot, there's a way to eliminate that, but in general, the number that comes up here includes the noise of my analyzer and my uh, and uh, and the device being tested. And these devices are so good uh, that some of what you see in here is my analyzer. At 20 bits, the device dominates. But once you get to 22 bits, it's really my analyzer's noise here, the one I'm testing. For headphone amplifiers, I actually make a secondary measurement, and I'll do a, a detailed walkthrough of headphone. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, headphone amplifier measurements in the future. But for now, notice that I also test the uh, the uh, headphone amplifier at 50 millivolts. So remember, this was a four volt uh, test, just like I had done in my audio precision demo that I just gave you. But I also do another test where I take the volume control and crank it way down, and I measure the output till it reads roughly 50 millivolts. And then I get it set, run the same test again. And now you see how much it's dropped, substantially drops. Again, remember, the noise is fixed. So if you take the 4 volts and reduce it down to just 0.05 volts, which is what 50 millivolts is, now the noise is a much bigger uh, uh, portion of that. And then we get the dynamic range. Here, we only have 13 bits now, obviously. We're, we're not even at 16-bit audio. Best case, if you look at it in this graph, I plot all these things. The best case that I've ever measured has been, uh, by the way, I should say A30 Pro, is uh, 95 dB. So we can achieve the dynamic range of a, of a CD while playing at just 50 millivolts. You might say, why do I care about 50 millivolts? Well, when you use in-ear monitors, these little jobbies, they sit really close to your ear canal and uh, they can be quite sensitive. I mean, that driver doesn't need to move more than a fraction of a hair to generate sound. And so you crank the volume down to listen to them. And when you crank the volume down, you're operating at way below four volts. Uh, I'm sure none of these IEMs you would use as four volts. So when you do that, when the music is not playing, like it pauses or fades between tracks, you don't want to hear a hiss, right? I mean, it's annoying to hear, you know, between tracks or when the tracks get quiet. So you want this dynamic range to be as good as you possibly can. And from anecdotal data, using this output level, once you get to 90s, you're golden. Below 90s, it can be audible, and uh, this device is okay but not great you can see how bad it can get and get down to 45 so uh but average about 80 81 and this is average so with this amplifier i would say if you have very sensitive iems uh in your monitors you might hear some hiss and uh you know how much bothers you it's up to you where did 50 millivolts come from out of a hat i saw somebody refer to it on some other forums i said hey how about measuring at 50 millivolts we picked 50 millivolts comes out to be a very small amount of wattage you can do the math square this and divide it by the impedance of your headphone and you can get that but it's a fraction of a milliwatt so very small amount of power but again these little in-ear monitors are quite sensitive and uh, you can hear it okay so Nothing too complicated, but you got to understand the logistics of these things. This is why I mentioned that this is four volts in and out. It's so important. You can get a dynamic range spec from a manufacturer, and it won't even tell you this number, won't tell you the bandwidth, won't tell you anything. So those numbers have no meaning at all. You know, if they're not giving you the voltages as I am giving it to you, it is not useful. And uh, 
uh, and they need to give you the bandwidth. I need to do that too, but in this case, I'm lazy and implied that it's 20 kilohertz bandwidth uh, on this thing. Okay, hopefully you found this video useful. Um, I'll do more of these drill downs uh, for each one of the measurements if I can you know, put them together as a package that makes sense like this one. As I said, this is a much longer topic of what is the dynamic range that you need. There are a lot of questions about what's audible in the comments I get. And that's the first step in understanding, uh, you know, what is the needed dynamic range. I've already given you some hints in here as far as threshold of hearing and what the CD format can do, but there's more to it than that. And there's a lot of misconceptions there. Okay, hopefully you liked this video and uh, don't mind going back to school and, and taking these lessons. Uh, I'll uh, see if I can post something on a, a variety in, a few, in the next video rather than all these tutorials. Okay, see you in a future video. Bye-bye.